the scripture said to us I will therefore that men should pray everywhere lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubting today we want to raise our hands in worship to give God praise and to invite him into our midst amen this is the day that the Lord has made we will rejoice and be glad in it praise be to the name of the Lord so I'm gonna invite you everybody to just raise your hands as, as we said before and always the upliftment of hands are a sign of surrender the upliftment of hands also is a sign of trust and confidence back into the hands of God saying Lord I have done all that I could now I am putting it over unto you amen if you love the Lord say amen if you love the Lord, say praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Come on, let us all pray together in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Dear Lord, we give you thanks and praise today. As we raise our hands to you, Lord, in thanksgiving. As we raise our hands and bow before you. As we bend our hearts and bend our soul and bend our spirit before you. We want to say, Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for your graces. Thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, for the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed 2,000 years ago. And he, the Holy Spirit, made it relevant for us for today. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we adore you. Oh, somebody tell him hallelujah. Somebody tell him hallelujah. Somebody tell him hallelujah. 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 Lord, we are grateful for sparing our lives. We are grateful for your tenderness and your mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, purge our minds now and purge our hearts and purge our lives. Purify and sanctify us as we dedicate this day of service to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, Father, we surrender all to you and we invite your presence. Be in our midst. Be in our midst. Be in our midst in the name of Jesus Christ. And as we worship, as we read your scriptures, as we preach your word, as we proclaim Jesus Christ, we pray now that you will dispense grace, grace for healing, grace for miracles, grace for signs, for wonders, grace for transformation and salvation, grace for blessings in our midst, that you will send the grace and dispense your grace amongst all of us. Stay in our hearts, Lord, as we dedicate this day of service and adoration to you and give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise that you deserve. You are the most holy, most righteous God, most saving, hallelujah, and sanctifying Lord. Father, we thank you and we praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. All for thy glory, in Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen and amen you may be seated for a minute please and i'm going to leave with you reverend thomas and she's going to be reading today from exodus chapter 18 exodus chapter 18 beginning from verse 13 through 27 i'm going to repeat it again exodus chapter 18 verses 13 through 27 reverend thomas please Exodus 18, <clears throat> verses 13 through 27. This is the King James Version. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood by Moses from the morning unto the evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw that he did to the people, he said, What is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone, and all the people stand by thee from morning unto evening? And Moses said unto the father-in-law, because the people came unto me to inquire of God, and they have a matter, and when they have a matter, 
they came unto me, and I judged between one and another, and I do take them, I do make them know the statue of God and his law. And Moses' father-in-law said unto him, the things that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear, a, wear away both thou and this people that is with thee. For this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Hearken now unto the voice, I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people of God ward, that thou mayest bring the cause unto God, and thou shalt teach them accordance the law, and shall show them the way wherein they must walk, and the work that they must do. Moreover, thou shalt Thou shalt provide all of provide thou shalt provide out of all the people able them able men such as fear God men to trust hating covetousness and the place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. And let them judge the people at all season. And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So, so shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden of thee, burden with thee. If thou shalt do this thing, and God, and God command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure and all, all this people shall also go to their place in peace. So Moses hearkened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. And Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, ruler, rules of thousands and rules, rulers of hundreds and rulers of 50 and rulers of 10, tens. And they judge the people at, the, at all season and hard, and hard courses they brought unto Moses, but they shall matter, they judge themselves. And Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went this way unto his own land. Here I in the reading of his holy word by saying, Amen. 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 So I'm going to invite you now, Brother Henry. We're going to be reading 1 Peter chapter 5. 
First Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. First Peter chapter 5. Brother Henry, please. First Peter chapter 5, beginning from verse 1 through 4. Read First Peter 5. Yes. 1 through 4. The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking oversight thereof not by constraint, but willingly, not by filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither also being a lords over God's heritage, but, a man, but being in samples to the flock. Verse 4, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall receive a crown of glory. We have a third reading, and you can remain seated for that third reading. And it's going to be found in the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 3. St. Mark, Gospel, chapter 3, beginning from verse 13. Uh, Bishop Samuel is coming, please. St. Mark chapter 3, reading from verse 12, reading from verse 13. And he go up into a mountain and called unto him whom he would, and they came unto him. And he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach and to have power to heal sickness and to cast out devils. And Simon he surnamed Peter, and James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James, and he surnamed them Boanerges, which is the sons of thunder, and Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him, and they went into an house. Come on, people of God, put your hands together. Lift up your hands. Hallelujah. Give God a shout of praise. Seconds, just give God your best praise. Yes, Lord, yeah. If the way that you praise the best, yes, lift your hands, we open up your mouths, we clap your hands, yes, give them a sacrifice of praise with the fruit of your lips.
cause you're faithful. Praise cause you're Come true. Come on. Praise cause there's nobody. Everybody praise. some special people that we want to be ordaining and installing. We have one ordained minister and then licensed ordained minister and then we also have some lay ministers in our church here and we are going to be ministering to them too and installing them. So I'm going to invite all of you candidates please to stand. Yes. Yes. Amen. One of the candidates that are not here is uh, Brother Douglas Miller. But um, he had to travel out and he won't be back perhaps until tomorrow. So he couldn't escape from his job and get here. But as we get ready now for this, I'm going to invite the overseer of the Church of God and he's here with us today for this special occasion. All right? And praise be to the name of the Lord. Remain standing, please. And I want you guys to stand with me as we do this presentation in the name of the Lord. To our presiding bishop, Bishop Stan Holder, presiding bishop of the Church of God, 
for the state of Maryland, which is also known as the Delmarva DC region. Trusted in the guidance of the Holy Spirit, it gives me great honor to present unto you these candidates who has been elected by us to be consecrated and ordained as ministers in the Church of God and also in the Metropolitan Church of God. We therefore ask you as our beloved Bishop to lay your hands upon them in the Pentecostal power of the Holy Spirit, to consecrate them in the Holy Order as ordained minister, lay ministers and elders in the one holy, universal, and apostolic Church of Jesus Christ. We further certify that these candidates have been satisfied or have satisfied the requirement of the Holy Scriptures, and we believe them to be qualified for this and their office. So I present to you these standing candidates. Praise the Lord. What a joy it is to be with you today on this very special occasion. I've been looking forward uh, since we set the date to come and to worship with you and to have this opportunity to uh, recognize some people that, e that either have achieved through uh, study and testing of the uh, ordained minister uh, certificate or they have been elected and appointed as a leader and elder of this church. And so today we're going to take a few moments out of this service and to uh, set them forth. Amen. Before I do that, I do want to thank uh, Dr. Ricardo Cachadon for the invitation. If you're visiting today and you've never been in church with him, he's one of the finest pastors and preachers that you would ever want to meet. I uh, honor you today and I thank you. God bless you, my friend. I have the greatest of confidence in him and the finest first lady anywhere in the church of God, Sister Aurora, we love you. God bless you. We honor you here today. I'm going to ask if the five of you will come and stand here uh, in, in front of this pulpit. Come and stand right here. And uh, yes, to stand right here. I want to give a charge and then I'm going to share some things with you today. The term ordain comes from a Latin word which means to set in order. Paul commanded Titus to set in order the churches in Crete. This included the ordination and or appointment, which is we're doing both today, of elders and leaders. He said in Titus chapter 1 verse 5, for this reason I left you in Crete that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I have commanded you. Again in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 11 we read, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm speaking the truth in Christ and not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and in truth. So when they had appointed elders in every church, the word says in Acts 14, and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in which they had believed. This morning, I wanna share some things with you first, that this appointment and or ordination is a charge that we give ourselves to God as a living sacrifice. Romans 12 and 1 tells us very clearly that we are to give ourselves a living sacrifice. Holy, holy, holy and acceptable unto God. Notice that you can't be acceptable unto God if you're not holy. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world 
but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Peter said this. He said, if anybody speaks, <coughs> let him speak the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability as God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and dominion forever. So first of all, it's a charge of giving ourselves to God. Secondly, it's a type of dedication to the church. These people that are standing before you today, we expect them to live at a higher level and a higher calling. Now, all people should, but if anybody is going to, it's the people that stand before you today. And thirdly, this act is of dedication of humankind. This is us taking the time to recognize them for the work that God has called them to do. Now, let me say this to you. It's quite clear that Paul considered himself put into the ministry. I have never doubted that God called me to lead and to be a minister. I've never doubted it. I have questioned it. Many times I've wondered, why would he call me? Why would he choose me? My father wanted me to go to Duke University and be an anesthesiologist and put people to sleep for a living. He'd be so proud of me today because I put people to sleep every morning, you know, on Sunday morning now when I get up to preach, amen. Amen. But I, 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 love, I love what is said here in Galatians chapter 1. But I make known to you, brothers, that the gospel which is preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. But it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what we're going to do today is set them in order to these men that have been appointed as leaders, as elders in your church, I charge you today to lead by example. I charge you today to live a life above reproach. Amen. As well today with Sister Barnett, Sister Sonia Barnett, she has received the credential of ordained minister in the church of God. Ordained minister. We are so proud of you. Now, it's one thing for us to be appointed and prayed for, but she had to study a little harder, work a little longer, go through a lot of training classes. She had a, a CAMS program she had to go through, we call calling in ministry studies. Then she had MIP, ministerial internship program. She had manuals, she had to study, she had to be interviewed by a board. We had to do background checks on her, make sure she hadn't been in prison. Actually, to be honest with you, we've actually credentialed people who have a past of being in prison. I believe when God forgives, he forgives, don't you? Amen. God can take anybody and do anything he wants to do, amen. If he can use Balaam's donkey or if he can use a rooster to get Peter's attention, he can call me to do the work of ministry and he can call you, amen. But God has, God has set aside this moment in time uh, to, for this church to recognize you and for this denomination, Sister Sonia, to recognize you. Because uh, we're, I'm so proud that you have not stopped. You have continued on. And if there was a higher credential for you, I would want you to pursue that too. And maybe one day we will in the church of God. But you have gone from a credentialing point of view as, as far as you can go. And for that, I commend you and I congratulate you. Amen for taking that time. Scripture commands us to commission leaders. And uh, Paul said it this way, that we are supposed to take the time to set things in proper order. You are a visible answer 
to structure that the Bible requires. Have you ever been to a church that didn't have any structure? It's just chaos. But you, this, this is a visible reminder to us today is that we have structure at the Metropolitan Church of God and we have structure in the Church of God. Listen to this. Paul's official ministry did not begin until Barnabas presented him to the church at Antioch. And his full ministry was not realized until he was dispatched by the Antioch church in response to the Holy Spirit's prompting. I expect you to do the work of ministry. Let me say that again. I expect you to do the work of ministry. How many credentialed ministers are here already? If you're credentialed, you have an exhorter certificate, an ordained minister certificate, or an ordained bishop certificate. Let me, let me see your hand. One, two, three, four. I'm, I'm here. Five, six, seven. Anyone else out here? Listen, what a wonderful honor that is. I do not expect you, if you hold that credential, you don't get that credential just so you can sit on your seat and do nothing. I got a sermon I preached years ago when I preached youth camps on nursery rhymes, and one of them was about little Miss Muffet that sat on her tuffy. And another one was little Jack Horner that always sat in his corner. What I'm saying to you is, if you don't want to get up and do the work of ministry, it would do any five of you good to sit down right now. Because we'd be wasting God's time and the church's time. Amen. So today we're going to present you four men with a certificate that we have signed. We're going to present uh, Sister Sonia Barnett with her ordained minister certificate. We're going to lay hands on her. Uh, Bishop Catchedon and myself, we're going to anoint her with oil in a minute. We're going to anoint all of you with oil as well. But I charge you today to do the work that God has called you to do. Be a student of the Word of God. Be submissive to spiritual authority. You ever met anybody with an unteachable spirit? People that already think they know more than anybody else? And when you try to point something out to them, they always want to find an excuse why it's not them, that it's you instead of them. Yeah, I have to. You are called to teach and to be taught. You are, you are challenged to go beyond the milk of the word to the meat of the word. And so today I, I challenge you to do the work that God has called you to do. I challenge you today to live above reproach. First of all, I want to present these certificates to our four brethren here. First of all, this is Brother Henry, right? Right here. Oh, the Word Man. The Word Man. I thought you was going to preach. Amen. I love that. I can tell that you love the Word of God, brother. I love that. Brother, brother Henry, I want to present this to you, a certificate of recognition that certifies you've been recognized as a lay leader on this day for the Metropolitan Church of God. Amen. I present Brother Barclay. I present this to you. Thank you. We've met before. We've, we've spoken before. We were all a part of the transition we went through a while back, weren't we? And to thank you for your faithfulness to God, I present this to you, my brother. God bless you. Brother Cunningham, I present this to you, my brother. How you doing? It's good to see you again. I appreciate you. What a beautiful spirit Brother Cunningham has. Amen. Such a kind spirit. Amen. I present this to you. And then we have here Brother Garfield Campbell. Gam, Gam, Cam, Campbell or Gamble? C with a C. Campbell. Brother, Brother Garfield Campbell, I present this to you. We're so proud 
of you. I don't know that you and I have met before. If we have, we haven't spent as much time conversing as I have with these other three. Is that correct? All right, welcome. Welcome. I look forward to working with you to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ through the Metropolitan Church of God. Amen. First of all, before we get to Sister Graham, I want to anoint them with oil. I'd like for you to come, if you will, and stand behind them. Amen. Stand behind them, and I want to pray for them. Understanding, give them God the ability to see like the sons of Ishakar that discerned the times and knew what to do. I pray that these men will discern the times we live in and know what to do. Hallelujah. Thank you now, Lord. As they arise here in a moment, God anoint them by the Holy Ghost and use them mightily for your glory, your honor, and your praise. In the name of Jesus we ask. Hallelujah. 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 Amen and amen. Somebody say praise the Lord in the house. First of all, be true to the word of God, Sister Graham. God's word is the most precious thing that we hold in our hands. And as you teach and as you preach, you do so under the anointing of and the inspiration of the Holy Scriptures. I believe with all of my heart that God's Word is infallible, it's inerrant, and it is exactly what the world needs to do to remove the chaos from our society and bring Christ back into the center of it. You have been used. You have been called to do that. I present you with your ministerial credential, number 88400. Ordained minister, Sister Sonia Barnett. I'm so proud of you. And I so thank you. Dr. Hill has signed that along with myself. And I present this to you and congratulate you on your great accomplishment today. Amen. And before I pray with you, I've got a little something to add to your wardrobe today. Amen. He's going to hold that for you. Can I can I put this on you here? Just a moment. Church, I'm going to ask you to stand with me and stretch your hand this way. Hallelujah. Father, I anoint this sister with oil in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. I want to thank you for the call of God that's on her life and the obedience that, Father, she is walking in to accept your call. God, I lay hands on her and I pray that an unction and an anointing of the Holy Spirit will reside upon her as never before. As she arises every time to teach and to preach your word, God, let it be as if they're hearing from you yourself as you flow through this vessel, as you speak through this vessel, that she may touch the world through your touching and speak to the world through your speaking and love this world through your loving. As she goes into all the world to preach the gospel, I pray, God, that she will be received and find favor everywhere that she goes. 
And should she come somewhere that does not receive it, that she will shake the dust off of her feet and continue to do the work that you have called her to do. I ask you, O oh Lord, today to give her souls for the hire. Give her sheaves to lay at the master's feet. I ask you, O oh Lord, that many will come, hundreds, thousands will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through her ministry and through her calling. God, we set her forth. We send her forth. And we pray, God, great blessing and honor and favor upon her. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Hallelujah. To God be the glory for great things you're going to do through this precious child of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that she's accepted your call and she's ready to go and do the work that you have called her to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, put your hands together and give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. your Bible stand with me one more time and I'll let you be seated then for a few moments we're looking at John chapter 21 I want to preach a message a challenge to our leaders and to the church today called lessons for legacy leaders lessons for legacy leaders we're going to John chapter 21 when you get there say a good praise the Lord amen there's five of us there I'm gonna give you another minute amen John chapter 21 when you're there say amen after these things verse 1 after these things Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the sea of Tiberias and in the way he showed himself Simon Peter Thomas called the twin Nathaniel of Canaan Galilee the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together Simon Peter said to him I am going fishing they said to him we're going with you also they went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it, because there was a multitude of fish. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now when Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net of the fish, the net of fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net up to land, full of large fish, 153. That's a pretty good day's fishing. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, come and dine. Yet none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you, knowing it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Praise the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, anoint your servant to speak this truth today. I pray, God, that as we hear your word, that we'll be quickened by the Spirit to receive it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you as you're seated. Now, I have a flight to catch in a little while, but I'm going to do my best to be eternal without being everlasting. I do want to share with you, and I do believe that if I can get out of here in uh, about 40 minutes, 45 minutes, I'll be in great shape to get to the airport. But if I'm a little longer and the Lord wants us to be longer, there'll always be another flight and somewhere along the way. Amen. But thank you for letting me come today. It's Easter, just before daybreak. 
and two women are coming to the tomb. The Bible says they have spices in their hands. They're going to put them on the body of Jesus, their hands filled with preservatives. These women were the first at the tomb, but that doesn't mean that they were looking for a risen Jesus. They were looking for a dead Jesus. We know they were looking for a dead Jesus because they had preservatives in their hand to put on the body. They looked in the tomb and Jesus was not there. They did see a folded napkin there, which is a Jewish tradition, which tells us that if the napkin is folded, that means that the master will come back. And so it was folded and they recognized that. And the women saw that the tomb was empty and they noticed that the soldiers guarding the tomb were gone. And we discover that on the night in question, the soldiers had been arrested by the glory of God and the stone had been rolled away. Jesus had told them that he would rise again. He told them what would happen, but they noticed this. They noticed that he was not there, that he was risen from the dead, and then they were told to go tell the disciples what you've just witnessed. And sure enough, they did. John chapter 20 records the first post-resurrection appearance of Jesus. That's when she, he appeared there uh, to Mary. She thought he was a gardener, but it was the Lord. The second was a locale not too far away from the tomb. That's where the people had gathered mourning the death of Jesus. And the Bible said that he literally walked into the room. He walked through the door in a his in not his physical body but in a uh, temporary spiritual body the third time that he appeared to the disciples is in the story that i just read to you here's what happened jesus said i want you to go to galilee and i want you to wait on me i'm coming i'll be there your assignment is to go and to wait And while they're there, apparently Peter got a little anxious. He didn't want to wait anymore, so he decided that he wanted to go fishing. Now, fishing's not a bad thing to do. I enjoy fishing every once in a while myself. But the Lord told him to go wait, and Peter decided to fish. And the other disciples said, you know what? I'd like to go with you. So now the count is seven. Seven people are going fishing. Seven men decide to go fishing instead of waiting for Jesus in Galilee. They fish all night. They don't catch anything. It's the next morning is coming and they look on the seashore and they see a man. They do not know yet it's Jesus. They recognize him and uh, they looking, trying to look through the crowd, through, through the, through probably the fog to find out who it is. And they hear a voice from the seashore that says, children, have you any food? In other words, he was asking, well, did you catch anything? And their immediate response is, no, we haven't caught anything. So the voice on the shore tells them, now cast your net on the right side of the boat. And when they did, the Bible said that the net was filled to capacity. We know that because the Bible said it was so full, it did not break. And then John recognizes who the man on the shore is. He said, guys, it is the Lord. Now, apparently, Peter doesn't like to fish with a lot of clothes on because when he noticed that it was the Lord, the Bible said that he put on his outer garment. I don't know. I don't think he was naked. The Bible doesn't say he was naked. He had an outer garment. Well, fish could be smelly. Maybe that's why he took it off. You could get wet and it could be cumbersome and heavy. Maybe that's why he took it off. Maybe it was hot. Maybe that's why he took it off. We don't really know why he took it off. What we do know is that when he came into the presence of Jesus, his attire changed. When he came into the presence of Jesus, he felt like he needed some more clothes on. Boy, I could preach there for just a moment, couldn't I? When he came into the presence of Jesus, he recognized, well, this is not a proper way to come into the presence of my Lord, so I'd better get my outer garment on, and I'd better come because I want him to be happy with me and proud of me when I come into his presence. That'd be a good lesson for you and I to learn today, that any time we come into the presence of the Lord, we need to come clothed in righteousness and clothed in glory. And it wouldn't hurt to have a few physical clothes on as well, 
can I get a witness today? Amen. I'm getting sick and tired of half-naked people going out and proclaiming what God has done for me, and maybe he did something on the inside, but I believe when he does something on the inside, it'll start manifesting on the outside. Amen. Something will change. You won't walk where you used to walk and you won't uh, uh, give uh, uh, the way that you used to give and you won't go to the places that you used to go to and you won't talk the way you used to talk. When Jesus comes into your life and he, he does a work inside of you and if you become a new creature in Jesus Christ your Lord, your walk is going to change, your talk is going to change, your lifestyle is going to change, everything about you is going to change because the, the one working in you is going to change you. Amen. Let me give you five quick lessons for legacy leaders. I'll do my best here to be quick today because I know that your mind can only comprehend what your seat can endure. And so I'll do my best to be uh, quick about this and I'll skip over a few things unless the Holy Spirit wants me to say it. And if he wants me to say it, I'm going to say it whether you like it or not. Amen. I'm going to Obey the Lord. Lesson number one, if you're a note taker, this is a good time to take a note. The first lesson I want you to learn today is this. The size of your vision will determine the size of your blessing. Peter's net represents a mindset. It represents a mindset of how many fish he thinks he can catch. We know that his net would catch 153 fish, right? We know that. We know that it was full. So it couldn't catch 154 fish. It could only catch 153, and it did not break. Allow me to say a word about vision to all of our leaders here today as we move forward because vision is very critical if we're going to move into unknown territory in this church. I've been to this church now a few times to preach. I've been here through a pastoral transition and we, uh, when one pastor retired and we brought in Dr. Catchadon and I've been here and I've met with you a few times and we've conversed with one another. And let me tell you, let me say something to you. I believe that what we have at Metropolitan is not all that God wants us to have. I believe that God has bigger nets and more people that he wants us to read uh, and to reach. And why is that important? Because there's a world that we live in that's in total chaos. And if this world ever needed Jesus Christ, it needs Jesus Christ today. New York Democrats and New, and, and, uh, and New York Republicans and, 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 and Congress uh, of both parties are pushing all kind of, uh, of agendas now that are, are anti-God and anti-Christian. I'm not here to pick on a party. I'm here to pick on a nation. Because this nation that was birthed in the Word of God and birthed in a prayer room is moving away from the Word of God and moving away from the presence of God. And if the church ever needed to be the church, it needs to be the church today. I'm here to tell you that God's got some fish that he wants you to catch. He's got some people he wants you to touch. He's got some people that he wants you to reach. And you've got to have a net ready to receive. Notice that there was no hole in the net. When Jesus called Peter, they're standing by the seashore, what? Mending their net. Why do you mend nets? Because they get torn. They get ripped. They get broken. And if you got a hole in your net, fish are going to get out. This net didn't have any holes in it because it caught as many as it could catch. If there's holes in your relationship, if there's holes in your church, why do you think we put people in position today? Because we're filling some holes in the church. We, we can't let fish get away anymore. We've got to have leaders that will stand together, stand unified and stand in prayer and stand with this pastor and stand with this first lady. Amen. Like Aaron and her, we've got to hold their arms up in prayer. And as long as we're holding their arms up in prayer, God's going to 
to help us win the victory. But when we start letting their hands down, the devil's going to come in and he's going to flood us with anxiety and depression and defeat. Child of God, that's not the testimony of a child of God. Amen. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Amen. We're on the Lord's side today. Amen. And greater is he. It's in us. We can do great things because of what God has done in us. My number one administrative priority is to raise up a generation of young people that display the raw power of God. I, I've got a few years left, Pastor. I don't have many, but I've decided I'm going to dedicate the majority of my time in finding and locating young people full of the Holy Ghost ready to do the work of God. Anybody of you was at the women's conference yesterday? One of them we've identified preached yesterday morning, a 19-year-old young lady preached under the anointing of the Holy Ghost because I believe there are voices yet that we have yet to hear from. And it may be your, there may be a voice in this room has gotten, God's getting ready to call and place his anointing upon. You may be the next pastor of this church one day. I want to find you. I want to locate you. I want to equip you. I want to set you forth. I want to anoint you so that you can do great things for the body of Christ. We have a lost generation of sons and daughters because we've got too many churches fishing with broken nets. I'm going to too many churches that would just soon to be a senior adult place. I'm not opposed to senior adults. I am one. I'm getting there quickly. Thank God for all of us that are 39 and older. Amen. Come on. I got a good amen here behind me. Where are our young people? Where are our young adults? Where are they? I was at church last Sunday night in Baltimore. I went to church and I'm driving to church. You know, most folks don't have church on Sunday night anymore. And I, I you know, I, hey, whatever, whatever you do, I'm fine. I'm not, I'm not criticizing that. Here, I want to make a point. I'm on my way to church and I couldn't get down the street because there were cars everywhere. I finally drove by one Mercedes and the, this woman was on top of this man. I don't know what was going on there, but it didn't look like they were having a prayer meeting, if you know what I mean. And then I, I was going around and people are walking down the street and, and I'm thinking, man, we're, there are hundreds of people. I finally get to church and there was 70, 80 people in church. And I'm sitting there thinking, people are going to find a place to go. That they, I asked the pastor, I said, what, what is going on about a block down the road here where all them people? He said, oh, that's the bar. And I'm sitting there thinking, well... It's not that people are going to stay home on Sunday night. They're going to find a place to go. I say they ought to go where the power of God has fallen. I say they ought to go where the word of God is being preached. Now watch this. Because we're losing a generation because the church has allowed their nets to get broken and our fish, our harvest has slipped through the cracks. The truth of the matter is this, my friends, that there's some of you been in this church a long time, and as you look around, you can probably name some folks that used to be here that aren't anymore. You can probably name some young people that used to be here singing and praising God, but they're not even in church anymore. No What's happened? Well, I'm sure the devil came in and influenced them, but here's what else happened. Our nets got broke. Can I say that to you in love? Our nets got broke. Jesus is not limited to 153 fish. He gave Peter 153 fish because that's all the fish he could catch. So you know what I say? Let's get a bigger net. Let's get a bigger net. Let me, let me, let me, let, let, let me teach you another lesson. Clarity of Jesus is directly related to proximity of Jesus. They didn't know who it was on the seashore until they got a little closer. When they got a little closer, they recognized it was Jesus. You say, well, Bishop, I'm having a tough time right now, and I don't really know what God's will is for me, and I don't know what God wants from me. Here's my advice to you. Get a little closer to him. 
If you'll get a little closer to him, he'll come into greater view in your life. You'll begin to see a little better. You'll begin to hear a little better. You'll begin to sense a little better. Did you know John Knox is the one that prayed, give me Scotland or I die? And Queen Mary of Scots said, I'm, I'm more afraid of the assembled armies of Scotland. Or let me rephrase that. She said, I'm more afraid of the prayers of John Knox than I am of the assembled armies of Scotland. How in the world can a man or a woman become so powerful? I got, I got an answer. Holiness. I believe holiness is the key. The Bible said that the seraphims, those angels that are perpetually around the throne of God, the Bible says they're holy. You know what? They're holy not because of who they are. They're holy because of where they are. <clears throat> you want to get into the presence of God, holiness won't be a problem. You stay in the presence of God every day of your life and all of a sudden things will start changing in your life. What I'm trying to tell you today is that the effectual fervent prayer of a, of a what? A righteous. You want your prayers answered? You want God to come down and minister? You want God to meet your need? The effectual fervent prayer of righteous people, holy people, sanctified people, set apart people. Those are the people that get their prayers answered, amen. We cannot be used of God for revival if our lifestyle reflects the very systems and ideologies of this world. Consecration is much more about who we're connected to, not what we're connected to. I'm Church of God. I was Church of God nine months before I was born. It's all I've ever known. But my identity is not in what I'm connected to. My identity is in who I'm connected to. You know what a spiritual apostate is? A spiritual apostate is a person that's had a spiritual experience without a lifestyle change. They'll come to church. They'll sing. They'll feel the presence of the Lord. They may even come to the altar. They may even pray. They may even cry a little while. But they'll get up the next morning and live the same way they lived on Saturday night. They've had a spiritual encounter. They just haven't experienced a lifestyle change. What the Lord wants to do is come into your life and he wants to give you more than an emotional experience. He wants to change your life. He wants to change your home. He wants to change your church. He wants to do a work in you, child of God. So Jesus has breakfast prepared. Go, let's get back to the story. By this time, the resurrection of Jesus is no longer subject to skepticism, criticism, or doubt. This is the third time now that Jesus has appeared to them. So this brings me to my third lesson. If your past was part of your purpose, God would not have called you out of it. I've got a question. Why is Peter still trying to go back to what the Lord has already called him out of? When Jesus met Peter, he was a trained professional fisherman. In Matthew 4, Jesus called Peter from the profession of fishing to make him a fisher of men. <clears throat> Peter got a directive from the Lord. He said, you go to Galilee and you wait on me. And during that time of waiting, he got anxious and started taking matters into his own hands. It's a dangerous thing to occupy your waiting time with what God has already called you out of. When you get restless, you get risky. Anybody ever had to wait on the Lord? God ever had you in a waiting room? And you get frustrated, you get aggravated, you go to the pastor, and I don't understand pastor, it's like he's got some magic formula that he can give you. And he, listen, I'm just going to tell you, I, he's a smart man, he's got a doctor's degree, but he don't have all the answers. Amen. He's got a lot of them, but he don't have all of them. 
there are some things that only God can answer. And there are times when God puts me in his waiting room and when I get impatient with God, my mind begins to wander just a little bit. You know, the mind is the devil's playground. Amen. He starts putting these seeds of thought. God doesn't love you. God hadn't heard you. God don't care about you. God's not going to answer your prayer. God don't have somebody from you. You're never going to get a raise. You're never going to get a better job. You're never going to get married. You're never going to, never going to, never going to, never going to, never going to. I'd make a good devil, wouldn't I? Because that's the way he talks to us. But child of God, hear me when I tell you, when God's got you in, your, in, in the waiting room, he's just, it's his timing, not yours. The best thing that can ever happen to you is if you start taking matters into your own hands is for your plan to fail. Notice this. Peter's got the right team. They fish all night, so he's got the right team, and he's fishing at the right time. We learn that they're fishing in a boat with a net, so he's got the right team at the right time with the right equipment. He's got everything that he needs to catch fish, and he catches nothing. Why? Because if it, if it works, if Peter's plan works, the upper room is nothing but an assembly hall. If Peter's plan works, 3,000 people don't get saved at Pentecost. If Peter's plan works, half the New Testament may never get written. Here's what happened. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, that God made all things. That means he made fish. Amen. So that night when Peter decided to go fishing, God pulled all the fish up in the Sea of Galilee, and he said, boys and girls, we're going to have a conversation here. He said, I want you to understand what I'm about to tell you is that there's a man going to be in a boat over in the Sea of Galilee over here on this area of the water. You can swim anywhere you want to swim in the Sea of Galilee, but don't you dare go near his boat. Well, can you just imagine one of the fish? Why, Lord? Because there's an assignment on that man's life, and you cannot derail the assignment that I put on him by letting him go back and be successful at what I've already called him out of. Are you with me here today? Are you hearing me with today? Listen, stay away, stay away from this particular boat because I can't let the assignment on this man's life get sidetracked. I've got a call on his life. He's called the people we prayed for today. He's put his hand upon you. Don't you dare go back. Don't you dare go back. Amen. There is a, there's a path before us that God has prepared for us where we're going to be able to bring down strongholds and see people set free. Don't you dare go back because if you go back, you're going to cancel the assignment on your life. Lesson four. I'm trying to hurry. God doesn't just schedule your successes. He'll also schedule your setbacks. Mm. Sometimes we fail because of our own insufficiencies, and there are other times when God knows when to let us fail because he's already ordered our steps for future success. Bondage in Egypt, then, could be a good thing as long as there's deliverance just ahead. Giants in the land can be a good thing because God's got a promised land he wants you to get to. Calvary could be a good thing only because Sunday is coming. That night fishing failure was a good thing because God had a miracle the next morning. And I, I'm beginning to notice a pattern here. You're a Bible scholar. I've noticed that ever since Jesus called Peter and the disciples to catch men, 
they've not caught any more fish unless the Lord gave them permission to do it. Look at this. When Jesus invaded their lives, I can't find anywhere they caught any fish unless Jesus miraculously intervened. Matthew 4 and Luke 5, he calls them from fishing. They didn't catch anything. He let them catch a few, and then he said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. 5,000 people show up on a hillside, and they don't have any food to feed them. And they find a little boy that has two fish and some bread. And he feeds them and turns that little boy's lunch into a golden corral. Can I get a witness? They need to pay their taxes. And the Lord says, you go fishing. And the first fish you take out of the water, that's a, that's a good example of tithe, by the way, your first. He said, you get the food, the, get the money, the coins out of their mouth, and you can go and pay your taxes. And now we're in John chapter 21. They go fishing and they catch nothing. You ever been fishing and caught nothing? It's frustrating, isn't it? I hate to go fishing when I don't catch anything. That's why they don't call it catching. They call it fishing. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. I believe in the complete sovereignty of God. That means God has the right to exercise his ruling power over creation at any moment and any time. Anything that's going to impede your purpose is going to get canceled. Anything that's going to sidetrack you is going to get canceled. The Bible said many are the plans in a man's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that will prevail. God's going to get his way. He's either going to get it with you or he's going to bypass you and he's going to get it without you. But either way, God's going to have his way. I've decided I want to be in on God's plan. I've decided I want God to use me. I've decided I want my name written down in the Lamb's book of life. I've decided that I want to be used by the Holy Ghost to touch this world for Jesus Christ. I don't want him to bypass me. I want him to use me. It gets worse. It gets worse. They got the right people at the right time in the right boat with the right tools. And they don't catch anything. And then the Lord asks them a question that everybody already knows the answer to. Well, did you catch anything? Now, I kind of think he said it in that kind of way. I can't prove it, but it's my sermon, and I'll preach it the way I feel like it needs to be preached. Well, children, do you have any food? Maybe before God can use us, we have to come openly and confess our failures to him. Hmm. No, Lord. No. We hadn't caught anything. They're sleepy, tired, frustrated, depressed, confused. Did you catch anything? No. He's making them bring their night failure into the morning light. The only way Jesus is going to make you quit doing what he's already called you from is if you face the fact that your way will never work. Jesus is building men who can build a legacy. He's getting ready to leave. Before he departs, he wants to make sure that they understand their mission. He's going to send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to empower them and use them. And the last thing he needs them to do is go back to what he's already delivered them from. Our human nature is to settle, isn't it? Seven credential ministers in this building. Don't raise your hand, but let me just say this to you. If the only thing you're proud of is the fact that you passed the test and got a credential, and you're not using your gift to touch people for the Lord Jesus Christ, you have settled. The church of God did not credential you so you could sit so sour. Can I say that in love? 
I preach to people all the time. They'll sing just as I am. They'll sit just as they are, and they leave church just as they were. Second Kings, there's a famine in the land. They got so hungry, they decided to eat a donkey's head and dove's dung. You got to be pretty hungry to eat a donkey's head, and you got to be starving to eat dove's dung. Dove's dung. Let, let, that, let that sink in. They got so hungry, the only thing they could find to eat was dove's dung. You know what? Dove's dung doesn't tell you where the dove is. Dove's dung tells you where the dove was. And there are people and there are congregations. Now, I'm glad it's not this church. I passed one, I'm sure. That they get up on Sunday morning and all they have is a celebration of dove's dung. What God used to do. How God used to move. How the old pastor used to lead. How they used to preach. How we used to sing. How we this, how we that. And we've done all the how we so long, our young people have slipped out the door The Bible said, says, faith comes by... Yeah, it doesn't say faith comes by having heard. Having heard is good. You've got your doctorate degree because you've heard. I'm a bishop because, but, because I've heard. But faith doesn't come by having heard. It comes by hearing. In other words, right now, at this moment, in this church, at this time, God's got a word that he wants you to hear. And by hearing that word, your faith is going to be built up. He wants to do something in you, and he wants you to hear. We go from glory to glory. That's what the Bible teaches us. We are the kind of people that are ever learning, ever receiving faith. Your faith is built upon the fact that you're continually being imparted into your life the word of the living God through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why preachers should never stop learning, nor members. We move deeper into this story. We find out. They're fishing. They got the right team at the right time with the right tools on the right day. And they catch nothing. And so the Lord tells them, I'm trying to hurry. The Lord tells them, said, now, I want you to cast your net on the right side of the boat. Last point. Jesus will take your limitation and turn it into a legacy. That's the last point. Now, I don't believe. Now, I can't prove this. But these men were seven professional fishermen. They knew how to fish, right? They had been fishing before. I personally do not believe that when he said to cast your net on the right side of the boat, that he was talking about the side perpendicular to the left. They were professional fishermen. They were, fe listen, when I go fishing, I don't fish with nets, but I'm casting everywhere I can cast. I'm going to the front, to the back, to the right, to the left, deep, shallow, top water, you name it. I'm throwing everywhere and anywhere I can because I want to catch some fish. They were professional fishermen. They knew they could throw the net anywhere, on any side, front, back, anywhere. They fished all night, and I do not believe that they threw the net one time and left it in the water all night. He said, you cast that net on the right side of the boat. See, here's the thing. My way is always the wrong way. His way is always the right way. <laughs> Your life is suspended and supported between what you catch and what he gives. I love this because he said, now, I've got breakfast prepared for you, 
but you bring your fish in. And the Bible said Peter throws on his outer garment. He jumps in the water. I don't know if it's over his head or not. It probably was. He begins to get to the shore. And the rest of the disciples are dragging the 153 fish to shore. Now, those are not the fish that Jesus had prepared. He had already prepared fish. He already has whatever we need to be successful. I was, all week I've been singing that song, All I Have Needed, Thy Hand Hath Provided. Great, great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto thee. Hallelujah. Isn't God good? Huh? Isn't God good? Isn't God good? Now notice this, and I've got to close. I've got to get to the airport. I don't think it was a coincidence that Peter was the first one to the fire. You remember how Jesus prepared the fish? The Bible says he prepared them on coals of fire. Okay? Now, you know, they didn't have microwaves or gas grills. That's the way they had to cook. But the Holy Spirit was very specific to let us know that Jesus fixed fish for them for breakfast on coals of fire. And Peter was the first one to the fire. I don't believe the Holy Spirit does anything by accident. And when the Word of God tells me that, I've got to ask the question, why is that important for me to know? Peter's the first one to the fire. Jesus has prepared breakfast on coals of fire. And Peter is there, and it has to be a memory to him. Because two weeks before, he comes upon a little girl. The Bible said she was standing by coals of fire. Imagine what's going through Peter's mind right now. I just denied him a few days ago, and I'm back at the very spot that I denied him, and now he said, come and dine. He's prepared something for me. Here's what will happen. By this time, Jesus is in resurrection power. Let me tell you what resurrection power will do. Resurrection power will enable you to have dinner with the very people that once turned their back on you. Resurrection power will enable you to dine with the people that once stabbed you in the back. And if you ever want to get victory, you're going to have to learn how to forgive. Forgive us our trespasses once we forgive those that trespass, right? No. Forgive us if we... No. Forgive us our trespasses as it's reciprocal. As I forgive, I'm forgiven. You see that? You say, well, they don't deserve forgiveness. I didn't say they did. But if you, don't, if you want to be healed, honey, you're going to have to get over it. My favorite line is, you got to build a bridge and get over it. You may never get an I'm sorry. You may never get a please forgive me. But you know what? I'm not going to let anybody with that kind of spirit hold me hostage. I'm not going to live in that kind of bondage. No, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. If you don't want to forgive me, that's your business, but I forgive you because I have been forgiven. I have been forgiven. I've done things I don't want you to know about. You've done things you don't want me to know about. In this building right there, or all, in this room right now, are all kind of testimonies of things, and we're just glad we didn't get caught. I said, we're just glad we didn't get caught. We should have got caught. We could have got caught, but we didn't get caught. And the Lord forgave every one of them. And if he forgave you, what are you doing not forgiving somebody else? What are you doing holding on to that grudge? What are you doing holding on to that unforgiveness? What are you doing holding? Let it go. Let it go. They may never pay you back. They may never pat you on the back. They may never do anything good for you again, but let it go, amen. Go ahead and let it go because whom the sun sets free is free indeed. I've decided I'm gonna live victorious. I'm gonna live free. I'm gonna be delivered, amen. I am not gonna let you hold me hostage. Before 
before the resurrection, it's all right. Before the resurrection, Peter was more worried about his reputation than he was the redeemer. But when he gets to the seashore, he's more interested in the redeemer than he is his reputation. That's God right there. That's God. Oh, I, listen, I've left a lot out, but I got a lot to say. But you hear me when I tell you. You're building a legacy here, Dr. Ketchadon. Sister Aurora, First Lady Aurora. You're building a legacy here. Somebody asked me the other day, what kind of legacy you want to leave, Bishop? I said, I, my legacy is twofold. They're called Chris and Jared, my two boys. I'm not looking for a statue. I'm not looking for a plaque. I'm looking for a well done, thy good and faithful servant. That's what I'm looking for. And when the Lord takes me home, I want two little boys that I've raised that are grown men now to be full of the Holy Ghost and fire and proclaiming Jesus Christ. One of them's a preacher, one of them's a football coach. I said, Jared, your, your mission field is as big as mine because you're touching young boys with the love of God. You witness to them every day as a football coach. I said, you keep on living that kind of life and you keep on living the life before them and you speak the truth in love and you let them see Jesus Christ in you. I'm not worried. I'm not worried about my name being in lights. I'm not pushing for any positions. I'm not trying to get elected to anything. Whatever I have, I have because the Lord has given me favor and men over me have appointed me to what I've got. I don't want anything that God doesn't want me to have, but I want everything that God wants me to have. And wherever he wants me, whenever he wants me, wherever he wants me, whatever God wants to do with me, that's what I want to accomplish in this world. You're building a legacy. 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 It is not about you. It is not about you. It is not about me. It's about him. got to decrease. He's got to increase. I got to get on my knees. He's got to stay on the throne. He's the God of glory. He's the Lord of the universe. He's the one that died on the cross. I didn't have anything to do with that. I just received the full pardon of sin. And today I'm preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ because the love, the blood of Jesus Christ has washed my sins away and the power of the Holy Ghost has infilled me to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Metropolitan. We're building a legacy. Let's don't fuss. Let's don't gripe. Let's don't complain. Let's build a legacy. Let's get our own personal pet peeves and agendas aside. And let's let Jesus be Lord of the church. See, I may never be back here again. I can say what I want to say. I've got a freedom on me right now. I'm not a bit worried about the airport right now. I'm starting to get loose here right now. I may never be back here. You may never hear me preach again. So as long as I'm your bishop, I've got to at least July, and we'll see what happens after that. But I'm going to speak what the truth says. Listen, you'll never build a church by having holes in your net. And as long as you criticize and complain and gripe and argue and fight, you've got holes in your net, and you're never going to win anybody to Jesus Christ. Humble yourself in the sight of God and man. And let's see what the Lord would do with us. Let's see what the Lord could do with us. One of the great leaders in this region was Dr. T.O. Lowry. He walked in the anointing. You know that. You worked with him. You're the, he's the reason you're in this region. Am I right? He brought you here. Am I right? That's what I thought. Now, God's got you here, and he's going to keep you here, but you initially got here, I believe, if I'm correct, he brought you here. Great anointing. 
I'm ready for God to raise up some more men like that. I'm ready for God to touch our young people. Listen, there are voices that we haven't even heard of yet. We don't even know their name yet. But God has got on our pews. It's waiting for us to preach a message under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to where the Holy Ghost can quicken the word to them and they will receive the call of God on their life and they'll get up and begin, begin to proclaim, Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Father, Lord, as I close this message and turn this back over to the pastor, I bring Metropolitan and lay it at your feet this morning. I give it to you. I give this church to you, Lord, today. Do something with us. And God, if we refuse to let you do something with us, do something without us. But I've got a feeling we want you, we want you to do something with us. I sense in my spirit a hunger to do something great for you. So Holy Spirit, in this house, at this moment, quicken every mind and every heart to the, you're the authority of your word and let us be obedient to your call. Mm, 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 mm. In Jesus' name. Forgive us. Forgive us for our flesh. Forgive us for our carnality. Paul called the church at Corinth, he called them carnal Christians. They go to church every Sunday, but they walked in the flesh. They walk, Paul said they walk like mere men. They're walking like men when we ought to be walking in the power of the Holy Ghost. Let that be said of this church that we're walking in the power of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. If anybody feels led to do it, just stand on your feet and just start proclaiming in Jesus' name right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Go ahead. In Jesus' name. Forgive me. Go ahead and make it right. Make it right with God. If there's somebody in the building, make it right with them. tell you a quick story. Hang on, then you're going to sing it. Hang on just a second. I was preaching revival in Michigan years ago. One of the greatest revivals I was ever in. And Sunday morning, the Holy Spirit stopped me in my sermon and said, you need to have a foot washing service right now. I put the women in one room. I put the men in another. We got the base as quick as we could. And we humbled ourselves before each other. And I sat there and I watched grown men start pulling up the leaders in the church. They went to the pastor and other leaders. One man looked at the pastor and said, I've talked about you like a dog. He said, I've criticized you. I've talked about you. I have blasted you with my words. And he, he bellowed out in, in tears saying, forgive me. Forgive me, I was wrong. Time after time, I saw people going to one another. And that, you know when revival started? when true repentance and humility came to that church. What does God need to do in your life? Go ahead and sing now. What does God need to do in your life? Who do you need to make it right with? I've got to leave you. I've got to go. I've got to get to the airport. I, I, I'm almost late and leaving now. But if you never hear me again, don't you stand before God with unforgiveness in your heart toward anybody. Make it right. First, make it right with God. And then make it right with each other. I love
love you. I love you. I love you.